Okay, good. Thanks for confirming. Just wanted to make sure that uh, it's working. All right. So we we were talking about object detection in the last lecture, and we will continue that topic. And this is uh, I will say like maybe the second best uh, second uh, my second best favorite lecture in this course. And in this lecture, I think we will talk about uh, three influential uh, influential papers, and I think recent papers. 20, 2015, 2016, and then maybe a uh, couple of years after that. So each of these come uh, subsequently in, in, uh, in subsequent years, and I think same set of authors. And they are used very widely. And I think if you are working in computer vision, you should definitely know these papers and you should try to understand like each and every bit of these papers because uh, they are almost used in, I think, uh, in most most of the problems where you have to solve detection. Okay, so last lecture we talked about object detection and uh, we looked into a very basic approach where we were using sliding window and then we talked about like uh, some very interesting concepts which can be used in uh, that simple approach. We also talked about evaluation and I think that's what we have to continue today. So how exactly uh, we can evaluate how good an object detection model is doing. And then we will talk about how we can perform object detection using a convolutional neural network. And we will cover three different uh, algorithms in this. All three are related. And the first one is uh, RCNN. This is like region proposal uh, CNN. All right, so Let's do a quick recap uh, what we did uh, in the last lecture. So the general approach was uh, we just use a sliding window and try to extract features from all the possible locations in an image and then try to classify those as object or non-object. And essentially this, this approach is not going to change. Even if you are moving from like this classical approach to uh, CNN, you will see that uh, this is the same intuition. I mean, it's not going to change. We are still going to uh, iterate over the possible locations and extract features from those locations and then we will try to classify it's just like the the technique which differs and the technique is more efficient but this these basic steps they're not going to change at all all right and of course post-processing we still do post-processing similar to what we are doing here Okay, so then the next step was, okay, when, when, let's say we have an algorithm and we can perform object detection, how do we know if it's performing good or not? And we, we uh, discuss like how we can use intersection over union to detect whether it's a correct detection or not. And usually by default, I think in most of the, in most of the applications, we consider this uh, intersection over union, we use a threshold of 0.5, but of course you can use different thresholds as well, depending upon what kind of application you have. If you are very restrict, uh, very strict about like you should have a very tight bonding box uh, compared to the ground truth, then you can try to increase this threshold. And these were some samples which we discussed la last time, like how the overlap actually uh, look uh, visually when we change the IOU score. Okay, so this is 0.9, a very tight bonding box, and it's drifting away, and you can see that the IOU is also reducing. Okay, so these were the basic concepts. Uh, I think uh, we don't have to cover them again. So we know what true positive is. We know what false uh, false positives uh, are and we know what false negatives are. And these are the terms which we'll use to uh, do the final evaluation. Uh, so the uh, one of the uh, very important concept which you should know is even if you are making a correct prediction, it doesn't always help you in improving the performance because if you have just one object uh, somewhere in the image and you make multiple predictions, then that's not good because essentially it was just one object there, right? So which means that if you have two correct predictions, I mean, uh, essentially they are correct, but we will only consider one of them as correct. The other will go into false positive. So this is very important uh, thing you should know. Okay, so then we talked about precision and recall both are actually trying to measure how good your algorithm is precision is about how precise your network is which means that if it's predicting something whether it's correct or not that's precision recall is again um, trying to measure the performance but like a slightly a different uh, variation 
it looks into whether you were able to predict all the objects or not okay so both are amazing different things and okay so let's go to uh, the actual evaluation which is called mean average precision and we briefly talked about this last time but this time we will go like uh, very carefully each and every step uh, how uh, actually this is computed okay so what we do is so any question before we uh, start this all right good so what we do is we have an <coughs> have excuse me we have an algorithm and we have the detections so each detection is just a bounding box and it will tell you which uh, class is actually present in that bounding box all right and then you will have a kind of a probability score how confident your network is because you are using a classification to actually classify it right so you have the you should have this score and you will have uh, all this for all the images so what you will do is you will take the confidence score of all the detected bounding boxes and create a list and that list will be sorted based on the confidence score so for example if you look here we have so these are all the different detections so these are just detection ids and these are like the corresponding images where these detections were actually predicted and here you can see that the confidence score so this particular detection uh, whose ids are so this detection was uh, coming from image 5 so the confidence score is 95 so this is on the top and again this is also 95 it doesn't matter okay so you just saw it. if there is a conflict you can just pick one and you can see that uh, this whole list is sorted based on this content score and ideally you will have a very long list depending upon how big your data set is and how many images you have and how many detections per image uh, you have okay so it, it, it's going to be a long list so once that is done that's the first step then what will what you will do is you will start from the top so this location is like uh, each row uh, in this list and what you're going to do is for each location, you're going to compute a recall and precision. And you know how to compute recall and precision. We just covered that. that. We start from the first row. And what we will do is we will go to, go to the image. We check the detection. Then uh, what we're going to the intersection over union of this detection. All right and based over union we are going to determine whether this particular detection is a true positive or a false okay so there are two aspects to that the detected class query should be right if the class category is not right we don't care it will go into and class category so if the class category is correct then we will compute the intersection over union and that intersection over union will be the with the ground truth and if the intersection say uh, uh okay it seems there's a problem is it still there okay so let me see what's wrong just hold on okay how about now can you hear me now okay good i think there was some network issue i saw that pop up it says like your network is not stable <clears throat> so sorry about that uh let me try to share it again okay so where did it started like uh you understand how this list is created was it clear until that point okay beginning of slide 15 all right so let, let me do that let me see what's the previous slide okay so this was uh, all uh, a revision so let me start from the beginning so what we do is 
so what we'll have we will have a testing uh, testing set right and in that testing set you will have a lot of images and then you will have a algorithm which can actually predict the uh, object detection in each of those images all right so then what will happen is for each detection you will have the bonding box all right and then you will have a confidence score with uh, that bonding box like how confident your network is and you will have a class assignment like which class this bonding box belongs to so whatever your network predicts that will be the output so you'll have three pieces of information for each uh, bonding box and this will be like there for all the images all the images uh, images in your test set now what you will do is you will collect all those predictions and depend and based on the confidence score you are going to create a list which will be sorted based on this score okay for example in this particular case let's say we have these images in the data set and these are the corresponding detections so you can have like multiple multiple detections in one image for example image one has a detection so these are just ids random ids you can assign whatever id you want so image one has a detection uh, with id a and the same image has a detection uh, with the id c so you can have multiple detections all right so once you have this uh, sorted list then the second step is you're going to go over all the locations in this list which means like all of these detections essentially all right and for each row you will compute recall and precision and let's see how we can do that so let's uh, talk about the first row and this is like coming from image 5 the detection id is r the confidence score is 95 so now we don't care about this confidence score it was used just to sort uh, uh, this list now the task is to compute uh, true positive and false positive first so what we will do is we will take this detection and we will compute the intersection over union of this detection with all the ground truth bonding boxes in this image okay so when you do that then you also need to verify that the class of that bonding box whichever whatever your network is predicting should match with the ground truth so if the class predicted class is not matching then it doesn't matter what's the RUU score you have all right and then that will definitely go into false positive but if the class also matches and the intersection over union the threshold also like uh, it, it also clears the threshold for example if the threshold is 0.5 so the intersection over union should be greater than 0.5 then it will go to true positive okay so a uh, question from fernando is id the same as label like dog car or yeah it's just a unique id for each detection it does it it, ha it has nothing to do with like this uh, the semantic meaning of the label it could it could be anything and basically you can just ignore it as well or just use numbers one two three four so you have a unique id for each detection from your network that's it okay so based on that RUU score and based on the predicted class, you will be easily, uh, you can easily predict, uh, uh, estimate whether this is a true positive or a false positive. If there is any doubt in that, please let me know because that's a very important step. Okay, so in this case, uh, this particular detection, the class was correct, uh, the class was correct. The uh, RUU score was also good. It was uh, greater than 0.5. So it's a true positive. All right, so that's that's why we have a one and we have a zero because it wasn't a false positive. Now we have two more numbers and these are like the, uh, you can say accumulated true positive and accumulated false positive. So in this case, uh, it will be one because of this and the accumulated, fa accumulated false po positive, we don't have anything. So it's a zero. Now using these two numbers, you know how to compute precision and recall. All right, you have, you have the formulas. Let me quickly go back okay so these are the formulas you just need true positives and false positives true positives and false negatives to compute these so then you can compute uh, the precision precision so precision will be uh, one over the total number of predictions which is also one so precision will be one and recall will be a number of correct prediction which is one over number of total predictions so in this case the total predictions is like uh, are the are uh, all the ground truth bonding boxes. Okay, so in this case, it's a big number, maybe 20 or something, or 15 or something. So it will be one over 20, and the recall is 0 0.06. 
All right, so I, I hope this step is clear because again, we just have to repeat this step for uh, all the rows in this, in this list. So now for the second one, again, we will repeat the same thing. In this case, it's a false positive for some reasons we don't know. And then the accumulated true positive is one, accumulated false pos positive is also one because it's coming from here. And if you compute the precision in this case, it will be again, uh, the true positive is one and total number of predictions are one plus one, two. So it will be 0.5. And again, for the recall, uh, it will be true prediction, which is one over all the uh, uh, all the bonding boxes you have. So which is not going to change. So you have the same number. All right, and so on and so forth. So just keep doing that for each uh, detection and you will get these values. So again, these uh, this is going to be a long list. So here, what you will observe is, as you move down this list, your recall is going to improve. Okay, you can see it's starting from 0.06. It's, it keeps increasing. So the, the reason behind that is because as you go down, you are actually making more and more, more predictions. So some of them will be true prediction, then the recall will improve. And some of them will be false predictions, then the recall will just stay the same. Okay, so the more correct predictions you have, the higher the recall value will be. And if you look at the precision, precision will generally uh, start at a high number because some of the initial detections might be true, so which will give it a jump start. But as you move on, you will see that uh, depending upon the performance of the algorithm, the precision is going to go down because as you move uh, along, I mean, you will have like multiple wrong predictions as well, right? And you can see that the confidence score is also going down. So as you decrease the confidence score, then your precision is also going to be first. So th that, that will be like a general trend. Precision will go down, recall will go up. And for precision, you might see like some kind of zigzag because, so because sometimes it might go down, sometimes it might go, might, might go up, okay? Depending upon whether you are predicting correctly or not. Okay, question from uh, Momal. What is confidence? Confidence score is, confidence score is your, the probability which your network is saying okay this particular bonding box is it belongs to this particular category right so for example uh, if we consider the algorithm from uh, last lecture then uh, we take each bonding box right extract the feature and uh, send those features to a classifier and your classifier is going to tell you whether a particular object is present or not and that prediction is going to be between zero and one. It will be a, it will be a probability, right? So that probability is actually this confidence score. Is it clear, Momal? Okay, good. Uh, IOU. So you are asking what IOU is, or I'm mm. not clear, sure. No, I thought. Confidence score is I, IOU, but that is different. No, 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 IOU, yeah, IOU is different. So IOU will be used to determine whether each of these detections will go to true positive or false positive, all right? So again, two criteria: the predicted class should be correct and the IOU score, which is like uh, the overlap of the detected bonding box and the ground truth bonding box that IOU should be greater than some threshold, which we usually consider 0. 0.5. So that, that's, a, that's a different thing, okay? Okay, question from Ozum. What is ACCT? So that's accumulated true positive. So what you do is you just keep accumulating the true positives as you move down in the list. So this is the first step. So that's the first one. So it will be one, right? Then you go to the next step. It's a zero. So again, it will be one. Then you have one more true positives. So you add it, uh, it uh, this one, you get two. No true positive remains two. So it will be two until you didn't get a true positive. As soon as you get another true positive, it will be three. Okay. And same is true for accumulated false positive. Uh, professor? Yes. And so each detected burning box has a confidence score associated with it. So if multiple right. burning boxes are detected in an image, then then what is this confidence score saying? So for each 
each for each morning box or detected box you will have a confidence score right so it's just telling you like how confident your network is and then this one single confidence column is like giving us a single confidence score per image mm -hmm. no no it's not per image it's per detection so okay. you can see here that image one can have like multiple detections right a and c so for each detection you will have a confidence score that makes sense right thank you okay and that's a good point all right so question from russia why do we need accumulated precision and accumulated record so you are going to use these accumulated true positive and accumulated false positive to compute the precision and recall so at each step you're going to use this no these numbers two and three to get these is, is it clear russia Sorry, I mean accumulated true positive and accumulated record. Uh, yeah, we don't have an accumulated true positive, accumulated record. Yeah, we have accumulated true positive and false positive. Okay, so I think you understood this. Good. Right, so now what we have after this step is we have a, a sequence of numbers. One sequence is for precision. And the other sequence is for recall. Now, what we do uh, is we just plot these numbers. Okay. And when we plot, uh, this curve is called precision versus recall curve. You might have heard this name. And I think we saw some examples in the last lecture as well. So the y axis is the precision, and x axis is the recall. So for each, uh, each location in that list, you will get a point in this uh, in this curve and you will just connect those points together to create this curve and you can see that uh, your precision is actually uh, going zigzag so it's reducing it's increasing reducing increasing as you increase the recall okay now once we have this plot what we do is we we simply compute uh, the area under this curve and that area under the curve is called average precision. So that's your main metric. Now let's try to understand uh, why we are looking into area under the curve. Now, if you if you if you if you think about this, if we have a perfect algorithm, then your precision should be one, and your recall should also be one, which means all the predictions are correct, and you have uh, recall is one. You have predicted all the detections. All right. So when that happens, and if you try to plot that, where will where will it go? It will go somewhere on the right top, right? Because the position should be one, and the recall should be one. Which means that if you draw the curve, it it is actually covering the full graph. And if you just compute the area of that uh, curve, it's like the whole area, and that will be like one times one. So one is your perfect score. But ideally, that won't happen because your algorithms are not perfect. So your precision might be low and your recall might be low. So what this precision versus, versus recall curve is doing is it's trying to test uh, the algorithm at different thresholds of recall. And at each recall, it's giving you some precision value. Okay, And you will see that uh, the precision is going down, which means that as you will go to the right, where recall is one, which means that you have actually detected all the objects your precision is actually going close to zero, which means it was making a lot of mistakes while doing that. So that's one extreme. The second extreme is this top where you say, okay, you have a perfect uh, algorithm, which is very precise, which, mean, which means that all the detections it has uh, predicted, they are always correct. But then you can see that the recall is zero, which means that it's actually predicting very few. So then just predicting one and saying that, okay, I'm perfect, that doesn't make any sense because you're missing a lot and your recall is going to be low. So those are the two extremes. And ideally like your curve will go like this. So this is like a real uh, scenario. And we want to push this curve towards the top right. All right. So, so that's why we compute the area under the curve. We want to maximize this. And uh, as we maximize this, uh, we are actually pushing it towards the uh, type, uh, top right. So to compute the area under the curve, what we do is we just ignore these uh, zigzags 
and uh, we try to interpolate the precision values. All right, so the way we do it is we start from the right and every time we see like a drop in precision, we just interpolate the maximum value here until we get like a similar level. So we just draw these horizontal lines. All right. And the idea is like, uh, once you have a precision level, I mean, there is no point of saying that, okay, if you reduce the recall, your precision is actually reducing. That is, that is, that doesn't seem right. But again, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, it's, it's not perfect, but that's exactly uh, what, uh, what we do. And once you have this interpolated curve, you can easily actually create these, uh, boundaries so these are like different regions or different rectangles you can say so you will have uh, a1 here a2 a3 a4 and you can just compute the area of these uh these rectangles so that will be just uh, the width and the height and just sum those up that is going to be your area under the curve and that will give you the average precision value okay so that's how average uh, average precision is created and uh, there are a lot of variations uh, how you compute uh, uh, this uh, this metric now this plot is just for one object category okay that's why it's called average precision now what you do is let's say you have 10 different objects in your data set you will create similar plot for all the object categories and fr uh, from each plot you're going to get one number which is average precision then you just average that number across all the categories and that is called mean average precision Okay, it's mean over all the classes. So that's one standard uh, metric. The other metric sometimes uh, what uh, we do is we actually just consider some of the uh, recall points. All right, so for example, like one uh, popular uh, metric is 11 point mean average precision. So we, what we do is we equally, we equally distribute like uh, these points starting from zero to one. So it will be like uh, maybe uh, at zero, then 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, all the way up to uh, one. So that will give you 11 points. And for each point, you just check, okay, what's the precision value? And then you can just average those values. So that that's called like uh, uh, average precision for, um, or, or 11 point average precision. So that's another, another variation, okay? Now, there was another question, I think from a couple of students, uh, Shah was asking in the previous lecture, what is, mean average precision then 0.5 to 0.95. So what that metric is doing is, so this plot is for uh, intersection over union at 0.5. Remember the threshold, which you use to determine whether this is a correct detection or not. Now, what you can do is you can actually create such a list for different threshold values. So this is for 0.5, then you can create for maybe 0 0.55, 0 0.60, so that metric actually compute the same score for different threshold values and just take an average. So ideally it's just checking uh, the MAP score at different thresholds, which means that one of those values is actually kind of relaxed where uh, the overlap is not that high, but when you are at 0.95, which means that your bonding box should be very uh, tightly located as compared to the ground truth box. So then you're computing whether your network can do that or not. Okay, so to capture uh, all those variations, you, you compute that metric. Okay, so I think that was all about the evaluation metric. Do we have any question? All right, not, so that's good. Uh, let's move on. Now, the second part uh, of this lecture is to understand how we can perform object detection using a convolutional neural network, okay? And uh, the papers which are, or the, the, or the algorithms which we are going to uh, discuss, they are like kind of recent. And uh, here I'm showing you the performance, again, the mean average position, and this is Pascal VOC uh, challenge. So we have a data set called Pascal VOC, which is uh, used for uh, solving object detection. And this plot is just showing the uh, mean average position value. You can see that like around 2007 started from maybe 16 or 17, so pretty low. So far from perfect, right? Uh, it kept increasing and around this time it was kind of saturating. So this is like best method uh, developed during this year. So it was increasing, but kind of saturating after that. 
And this is 2012, uh, the year when AlexNet or deep learning uh, kicked in, okay? And these are the deep learning methods. And you can see that it's going up. So in 2015, almost like the score is close to 80%, okay? And it, 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 it kept increasing. So that's good. So we are going to talk about uh, three of uh, these methods which solve this problem of object detection. Okay, so this is before CNN. These are all CNN based methods. So object detection uh, for deep learning, I mean, you know, we, you, need to, uh, you need to have a data set for training. And these are like three uh, important data sets, Pascal VOC, image detection, and then MS Coco. And uh, so these are just uh, some of the statistics. I think some of you are doing object detection for your project. So you should uh, be aware of all these, uh, all these details. So this one has only 20 classes. This one has 200 classes. And in this one, we have 80 different classes. And this is like the size of these data sets. You can see it's quite small, just 20,000 images. And this is huge, around half million, okay? And then this is uh, uh, 120K. And this here is showing like how many objects you have per image. So it's, it's not like you have just one object in, in one image, you can have multiple. So this is just showing like uh, the average over all the images. So this is 2.4 and this is pretty much close to 1.1, which means that for most of the class, for most of the images, you will only have one object. And this is the challenging one where you have a lot of objects. So there's 7.2 objects per image. Okay, so before going into the solution, how we can do object detection using CNN, let's try to understand uh, 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 what, what are the actual questions which uh, we are uh, trying to answer. Okay, so the first question is, what exactly we are trying to do when we are saying we are solving object detection, all right? So that we know that when we're doing detection, we need two things. First, we need the class category. The network should tell you which class is present. And the other thing is the location where exactly that object is present. So for that, you can have a bonding box, okay? So that's the detection task. And what do we compute for detection and output? So this is also fine. We, uh, we compute like uh, these two different uh, set of values. And the biggest difference from classification is in classification, we just need the class label. We don't care about like the localization. So we don't care about the bonding boxes. And that's going to make a big difference. And you will see like, uh, that is something which is making the problem more complicated. Okay, so let's see what can be like a very simplest solution to object detection using deep learning. Okay, so what we can do is we can have an image we can use a very standard CNN architecture, all right? So this could be like any architecture, LXNet, VGGNet, or you can devise your own CNN architecture, which will have like a sequence of layers, some max pooling layers, and some activations in between, which is going to give you a feature map. And I think you did for your programming assignment as well. Then once you have these features, you can add some fully connected layers to classify which object is present, all right? And you have a soft mix for that, which means that, uh, you only have one object category per image. So this is your standard network architecture for classification problem, okay? So let's see how we can use this to do object detection. So that's the first step. Now, what we can do is we again take the same architecture. These are the same features. And this was the classification head I was, show I was showing you earlier, which is like a bunch of fully connected layers and the class scores. Okay, so this uh, this will be called a classification head. So this is the same thing. I just uh, moved it uh, a bit uh, upwards. So we are not going to change this. But what we will do is we can add one more additional network similar to this, which is going to make predictions about the localization where the object is present. Okay, so let's see how we can do that. So we take these features. Again, we add like some bunch of fully connected layers. And in this case, uh, what we are predicting is we're predicting bonding box coordinates. And what these bonding box coordinate means is it will tell you where this object is present. So they could be like the XY location, the min max and the, the max XY, right? So for a bonding box, you will need four different values, which means that this network is going to predict four different values. Now, 
with this minimal example, you can actually train an object detection network. Because for each image, you will have a class label, you can train the uh, top head. And for each image, if there's like this object present, you have a bonding box for, for which you will have those values, right? The X, Y uh, coordinates of those bonding boxes. And if this network is predicting those bonding boxes, you can actually create a loss using those four values. So just ask your network to predict those four values. And once that is trained, you can take your testing image, it will classify, it will tell you which object is present, and it will tell you the location where that object is present. Okay, so seems simple. All right. Now, I think there is a question, question from Fernando. Even if we only have one label, we still need the top head, right? To know the object is even present. Yeah, that's true, Fernando, because you also need to tell which object it is. Question from Momal. It is also called multitask network. Yeah, that's true. You can see like this is kind of multi uh, multitasking. You have two different tasks. The first task is classification. The second task is object localization. Okay, question from what? I did not understand exactly. So a regression head is the part that finds the location of the object. Yes, that's true. So let me let me go over uh, this again. So the top branch is just telling you which uh, object is present, which should be fine because that's the standard classification. All right. The only addition is the bottom branch, which is actually also predicting where the object is present. And for that, we just need four values because those four values will define where to draw the bounding box. So this network will predict those four values and you can just compute loss. Okay, all right, great. So, okay, so then what we do is uh, a very basic approach. You can take this network, you can train for classification, you know how to do that. And then the second step, you can actually just uh, don't train this, keep it aside. It's there. And again, you don't train this one as well because this is already trained. What you do is you only train this head, you, which means that you're only training these layers. And this network is going to give you the bonding box location. And once it is done, you can actually attach this back and send in the testing image. This will classify, this will localize. Okay, seems simple. Now, right now, what we discussed, uh, we tried to just localize one object because we were only predicting four different values. All right. Okay, I think there's another question. Can they, can they be trained at the same time or is it necessary at all to train both simultaneously? Yeah, later on you will see like we prefer to train it uh, at, at the same time, but right now we are just uh, looking into like what's the easiest way. But of course, we, we train it simultaneously. All right, so now what will happen is, let's say you have C different classes. Okay, so if you have C different classes, then this head or the classification head is going to predict six different numbers. So which num one, number would, one number belongs to one of the classes. So that one number is going to give you the confidence score whether this class is present or not. Okay, so that's the top branch. Now the bottom branch, what we can do is either we can just predict four numbers, which we can say class agnostic, which means we don't care which class category it is. We just localize the object. Okay. So in that case, we just have one bonding box. So we only have to make four predictions. This is also fine. The other thing we can do is we can actually make it more interesting. We can make it class specific and we can have one bonding, uh, one bonding box for each class which means that for C classes, you will have C times four different numbers. Okay. And again, this is just saying that you will have one box per class and you can still train this thing. So, so far, so good. Now let's see uh, some, uh, some examples. Okay. Question from Russia. So we will calculate the loss based on the bonding box location. So accuracy also depends on the location of bonding box. Okay, so for bonding box, uh, we just discussed the metric ratio, right? We compute mean average precision. 
So that mean average position will depend on the location of the bonding box. And accuracy will be just like for the top branch, whether the classification is correct or not. But for object detection, we never use accuracy because accuracy doesn't make any sense. So we just have the mean average position uh, score. Is, is it clear, Rochia? Was that your question? Okay, good. All right, so now let's see, we have this image and uh, we have four different uh, categories. We have dog, cat, and then we have duck. So for this image, you can see that we have two different cats. We have a duck and we have a dog. So for each object, we will have X, Y, W, and H, four different numbers. So X, Y is, so this X, Y could be maybe the center of the bonding box, or it could be maybe the left top, uh, left top uh, uh, location of the bonding box. So it could be any location, but it should be consistent uh, while you're predicting. And then W and H is like the width of this bonding box and H is the height of the bonding box. So this is like one way uh, you make prediction for localization. You can have a lot of other variations as well. So this is one of the standard way. So you will have four numbers for uh, each of these objects. So one for dog, then one for this cat, and the third for this cat, and this one for the duck, which means you'll have to predict 16 numbers and you can compute loss over this. Now, if you have, let's say just two objects, so in this case, we have dog and a cat, again, four numbers. So total numbers are eight. So now the issue is when you train your network, then when you're designing it, you should know beforehand how many predictions the network should make. Okay. For example, for classification, you should know beforehand how many classes you are going to make, uh, uh, you're going to make prediction for. If you have hundred classes, you should know that because uh, that will design, that will help you design the final layer, the prediction layer. If you don't know that, if that is changing, then you're not able to actually, uh, uh, you will not be able to train your network. So same is going to be true for this uh, localization branch as well. You should know beforehand how many predictions you're going to make. But right now we are seeing that different images might have different number of objects, which is making the task difficult because we don't know exactly how many numbers should we predict. Okay, so in this image, we need 16 numbers. In this image, we need eight numbers. So that's the issue. Okay, so next I think we have a pop quiz. Uh, before that, do we have any question? A question from Curtis. Why does it count cat twice if they are the same class? So this is object detection, right? You detect all the objects which are present in the image. I mean, you could have 100 different objects of the same class, or you could have just one object, You could, or you could have none. You could have zero classes as well but you have to localize all the classes. So if there are two cats, you'll have to say that, okay, this is cat number one, this is cat number two. Okay, so question from what, how to deal with not knowing the number of objects to classify. So yeah, that's the problem. And we are going to, we are going to talk about that. Okay, so let's quickly uh, go to the pop quiz. I think one more question. Yeah, I haven't said the question. So the question is, if you have thousand different object classes, all right, and you are doing object detection, then how many values the network should predict? So right now you can assume that you don't have multiple instances, which means that uh, you just have one object in one image. And you should also consider like the classification head, how many values you will need for classification head. And considering these two factors, you will have to estimate like how many values your network is going to predict, predict to solve this problem.
So there was a question from Grace, is this model only detecting animals? Yeah, if this is for the pop quiz, I mean, we have thousand different classes, we don't care what they are. They could be animals, they could be something else, they could be birds or they could be some objects. Okay, and if you're talking about the examples we showed, yeah, in this case, we were just showing um, those, those animals. So those animals were the categories like in our, in our data set. Yeah, I mean, it's not class agnostic normal. This is for this is not class agnostic. Okay, can you explain the second point? So second point is because your network should also tell you like, uh, which class this object, uh, this bonding box belongs to, right? So the classification head. So you should also consider the values which are predicting, predicted by the classification head. Okay, I think that's enough. I hope there was no other question in between. So yeah, the right answer is 5,000. Because if you have 1,000 different object classes, it means that your network should predict, first of all, 1,000 values one for each class, which will say whether this class is present in the image or not. And then for each object category, you will need four values, which will tell you like, okay, where the object is present. So four for each, for thousand, it will be 4,000. So in total, 5,000 different values. Okay, good. So that's fine. Now let's look at, I think there was a question from uh mert or i don't remember uh like how we address this issue when we have a varying number of predictions okay so yeah so we need a variable sized output which is not possible now what we can do is we can solve detection as classification and what we can do is instead of sending in the full image to the network we can actually just send a bonding box and this you have seen earlier i mean that's the like uh, the the uh, very uh, well known sliding window approach which we have seen like for all the algorithms again the same sliding window, window approach uh, is going to be helpful here so what you do is you take a bonding box and just classify this and when you do that then you know the bonding box location x y and the height and width okay so for each bonding box again you will do whether it's a cat or not or do dog and not. So again, this is like the basic algorithm which we discussed in the last lecture. So you keep sliding and dog is no, cat is yes. Again, cat is no, dog is no. So this is the same uh, sliding window approach. Now, the issue was, first of all, it was computationally very expensive right? because we have to test a lot of positions and a lot of scales. We studied the pyramid, uh, the scale space pyramid last time. So th that's not efficient. And it's computationally demanding because uh, we have to run the classifier for each location. Okay. And because of different positions, different scales, it's, it's, it's not actually helping. So one simple solution to this problem, which was, which is actually the first paper using CNNs and it's uh, one of the uh, influ most influential paper in uh, computer vision. The idea was pretty simple and it, it was not something new but it was the right timing when it was done. So the idea was to only look at a tiny subset of possible solutions. What if we don't run the classifier on all the locations? Because I mean, objects will not be present in all the locations, right? They will be only in certain locations. So we only test at those locations. So that will optimize the, uh, the computation time a lot. And uh, that's called region proposal. You might have heard that for object detection. So these region propos proposals are like bonding boxes in your input image, which are potential objects. Okay, so the, now when you once you have these region proposals, then you don't have to do a sliding window and uh, you don't have to extract features from all the locations. You only extract features from 
these region proposals and these region proposals are telling you whether object is present or not so these are kind of prob probable uh, uh, object locations that's why they are called proposals i mean we are not sure but object could be there all right so now the question is how to get these region proposals okay and there are several algorithms uh, uh, to do that and these are like classical algorithms and they're like bottom approaches you just started uh, start segmenting your uh, images that's one approach and the segmenting you can just try to connect like pixels based on the color values the color values of the pixel and you keep connecting them and then you draw bonding boxes around these regions you can have so this will give you like a lot of lot of proposals then you can actually create bigger regions right then that will give you a uh, few proposals or you can have even bigger regions and this will give you very few proposals okay so these are like some algorithms which can be done we will talk about this uh, when we talk about uh, image segmentation not now so this is kind of performing seg uh, this is kind of segmenting the images and using those segmentations we'll get these proposals so let's say we have such an algorithm which we are going to discuss in the next lecture. But right now, just assume we have that and that algorithm can give you these proposals. Now, once you have these proposals, you just extract features from these regions and classify those. Okay, so that's the uh, first idea. Uh, question from Momal. Inverse Mexican hat filtering for blob prediction can work too. Yeah, that's correct, Momal. That's a good point. You can use it. even like your you can you can use your uh self feature uh detection the first part of self feature detection where you're just localizing on the interest points okay so here's the idea so this is the first step you know like what are the proposals and here comes in like the cnn part so what we do is we take these region proposals which is coming from classical computer vision and then we extract cnn features from these proposals all right, and this uh, turns out to be very effective. So what we do is we take the input image. So this algorithm is called like RCNN. So that was the first uh, deep learning based uh, object detection. And it's a very influential paper. But you will see like none of this is quite new. I mean, you have already seen this, but again, I mean the right timing and uh, I will say like a very, very well executed idea. So you have the image and let's say these are your proposals. So these are grayed out box and roughly you take like a lot of lot of proposals, not just two or three. So <clears throat> ideally you take maybe around 2000 proposals or even more than that. Now, what you do is once you have these proposals, you reshape these proposals into square shape. So this is called a region warping. All right. So some kind of interpolation might be or sampling might be required for that. And once you have these squared shape regions, so all of these will be of same shape. Okay, irrespective of what's the original resolution of these patches, you will make them square and all of these should have a same set of resolution. And once you have that, you can treat those as input patches or input images and send them to normal CNN network. So this is your standard CNN. And the CNN can actually give you features for these proposals. And you use those features to classify which object is present. All right, so you can use SVM for that, support vector machine classification, or you can use any other classification. In this particular work, SVMs were used, okay? And again, you will say, okay, I mean, this we have already seen, right? The last algorithm which we discussed, and that's true. That's entirely true. It's exactly the same thing. You're taking proposals, now, the one, one big difference is instead of directly extracting features from this proposal and sending it to classifier, you are actually reshaping it and using connet to extract the features. So that's one big difference. But again, it's just doing feature extraction and for passing it to SVMs. And then these SVMs will tell you which object category is present. And once you can do that, then you know that, okay, this bonding box belongs to this category and this is the localization. So your object detection is kind of solved. But of course, you'll have to perform a lot of, lot of post-processing because you don't have actually 2000 different objects in a single image, right? So again, the non-maximal suppression, all those things will come into picture. 
So that's why I said, like when I was describing that basic algorithm, those steps are never going to change. They will still be there. Uh, question from Ahmad, why is the image distorted? Any particular reason? Uh, the reason is your CNNs take specific uh, shape of input, right? You can't just send in like arbitrary shape to your CNNs. They expect it to be of certain resolution. So to make that happen, you have to resize all the patches to that resolution. Yeah, it's not illustration choice. It's the technical detail. Is, is it clear, Matt? Okay, good. Yes, so again, um, most of this you already know, but again, like how this was uh, plugged in together, that's something new. Now, one additional thing which we can do is we can try to adjust these bonding boxes because these boxes might not be at the right location. So what we do is we use these features to also make bonding box regression, which means that we also try to predict, okay, how much of uh, shifting is required so that this proposal actually fits exactly to the input object. So that distortion is actually uh, also predicted, which tries to refine these proposals to get better detections. And this is like the first algorithm which I was talking about, and this is called RCNN. So you can, so these are all the steps I think we, we covered. So each CNN will predict like two things, class score and bonding box. And this is the same architecture, which we, I think, uh, talked about initially. The only difference is instead of the image, you are sending in these proposals. Okay, so some details. Uh, so again, this is input image and let's say these are all the proposals. You will resize them, make them same resolution. And again, this is your CNN, which will try to uh, localize this. Usually we have uh, roughly around 2000 different proposals and the original paper actually uses LXNet, which was the uh, very popular architecture at that time. Today we can actually replace it with any uh, state of the art uh, CNN uh, model. And this was trained for thousand different classes, which means the classification head will have thousand different predictions. So that was uh, first trained on ImageNet just for classification. And then you fine tune uh, the same thing for Pascal VOC data set, which we discussed, which, ha which has 21 different classes. Right? So it was two step process. And some more details, this is fine. So this is just telling you like uh, the feature dimension, which was extracted from the CNN, it had four zero nine six different values. And then finally, like linear SVM was used uh, for the classification. All right, so question from Omar. Proposed regions are not contributing to final boxes in RCNN. What do you mean by that? I mean, the proposed regions are actually being used to extract the uh, the patches, right? Yes, and the again, uh, predicting the bounding box coordinates as the final task of the network. No, 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 no. we are not. Uh, okay, so that's the difference. We are not predicting uh, we are not predicting the bonding box. We are just predicting the adjustment, how much of uh, adjustment is required for this bonding box. So I think I should have a slide for that. Yeah, this is fine. All of this is fine. Probably we'll talk about this in the next lecture. So the prediction is not the bonding box, it's the adjustment. So if it's a zero, 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 which means that the proposal is already perfect, you don't have to make any changes, just use it as it is. And this prediction is saying, okay, this is not correct. Maybe slightly change it to left 0.25. You can see that the cat is on the right, right? Yeah. So you make those small adjustments. So those adjustments are actually predicted. Right, okay. thank you. So that's the famous RCNN uh, uh, model, which you might have heard about. And I think we, we, we can end it here. Next lecture, we will talk about the limitations and then talk about faster RCNN and then faster RCNN, which are like the more advanced version of this. All right, if there are any questions, uh, please let me know. Is my answer acceptable for the pop quiz? I mean, if the answer was right, it will be accepted. And if it's like few seconds, late minutes, fine. We still count that as correct. So I don't remember like what was the okay, question from Daniel. We will will we discuss YOLO and its variants? 
yeah daniel we will not have time for that uh so unfortunately in this semester we have like we have a lot of uh holidays and i think your yeah, next uh thursday we will we will not have the class it's it's a holiday and i think we have another holiday coming in so we have to skip some lectures in between and we definitely will not cover yolo but if you have any questions about yolo please uh visit office us or let me know we can discuss it separately okay yeah but that's perfectly fine don't don't worry about that all right so if there's no other question uh, let's end it here and uh i will see you next week thank you bye